spring coming up. I don't know. But this should be a good day. Um, uh, I was with, talking with Aaron, and the church phone rang just a little bit ago. So I answered it. And um, my, you know sometimes how you answer the phone and your voice echoes? I don't know what that is, but it was echoing and there was no one there. And I thought, oh well, and I hung up and I was talking with Aaron, came in here and I was up here and I heard voices, okay? Now, we all know that I'm not right anyway, but I was hearing voices and I realized I had my phone in my pocket and I thought, oh, somebody's calling me and I picked it up. I was calling the church and I'd answered myself. <laughs> on the phone. So today is a really wonderful day. Now you don't feel stupid anymore, do you? Your pastor is. Isn't that great? Let's stand and greet each other in the name of the Lord. this morning. Now, we do have a little challenge in that our wonderful computer, when Lillian turned it on this morning, did an update. Of course, you know, it's not supposed to update on Sundays, but it is. So, um, we will, uh, this one is easy, <coughs> the first one, because we believe. And why don't we have all the people up here sing the group one, and then you, re we, repeat it, okay? So, let's, let's get to singing. the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. We are the church and we stand as one. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy is our King. All glory and honor. All glory and honor are His to receive. To Jesus we to sing. Jesus we sing. Because we believe. We believe in the Holy Bible. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm we believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection. That Christ one day will return to earth. Holy, holy, holy. We believe in 
the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in his love that frees us. had a hi, and then we had a, this might take a few minutes. I think God has a message in this for us today. Let's sing together, Draw Me Close. I lay it all down again. I lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. To hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. No one else will do. Because nothing else could take your place. Cause nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. Bring me back to you. You are all. Nothing else. Cause nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you.
Amen. You may be seated. God is good. All the time. For our prayer time today, <clears throat> we first of all want to remember Penny Rose's brother, Doug Parks, who is having a cornea transplant tomorrow. So uh, we certainly need to remember him. Let's to continue um, to remember Pete um, for his upcoming surgery. Well, for many things, but particularly for his <laughs> upcoming surgery. Um, and also I would... Uh, or I should say procedure, I guess it's not surgery, but when you hear the word cyber knife, you think surgery, don't you? But Pete's going to be going, undergoing um, cyber knife, so we want to remember him. Um, I'd ask you to remember my daughter, Christiana. She is having surgery on Friday, and these, this is a quote from her yesterday. I can't wait till Friday. And I said, are you feeling okay? But she is in so much pain. Um, if you remember, a year ago, she had surgery on her shoulder with a torn tendon, and they replaced it. Well, she's been having more surgery. And I don't know if you remember um, the day they went back after the shooting at West Liberty last year. She tripped over a kindergartner and broke her arm. Um, well, they think during that time, something else happened to her shoulder, and it's only just now showing up. And the hole they drilled is bigger in the bone, is bigger than it was. That's usually a sign of infection in the bone, but they don't think there's infection. They don't know what's going on. So here's the biggest concern of all. They now, instead of doing laparoscopic surgery, have to cut. And she has chosen her wedding dress. So she's concerned, and I said, we have somebody in our church, Judy, who can work miracles with clothing. So don't worry, we're gonna wait till last minute and we can do whatever we need to do. So we'll be able to cover that up, don't worry about it. Let's go to the Lord our God in prayer today. Lord, we thank you for those two beautiful days we had this week. And today is a beautiful day, but in a different way. Help us to see the beauty of this day. Because so often we judge a day by the weather. And we're supposed to judge it by how much you love us. And know that you care for us. You never leave us. You are always there. Even when we take life into our own hands and walk away from you or just kind of do it ourselves. You're right there because you know at some point we will fail. And then all we need is you. Lord, we lift up to you those we have mentioned in prayer already. All those who will be facing surgery we think of Ken Ryder, too, Lord, who will be having some major surgery on Thursday. Be with those who are still recovering from surgery, all those who are in hospitals and nursing homes. Especially touch our loved ones, I mean our shut-ins. Lord, be with those who are a part of the outcast of society, the homeless, the incarcerated, those who have low self-image, those who are hungry and thirsty, people who have lost their jobs and find themselves living in a situation that they never dreamed of. Be with families, Lord, where abuse is an everyday occurrence. Be with our government and with our social systems. And Lord, give us hearts and minds and hands and feet to be more like you. 
touch us, Lord, for who we are becoming in you. And now we lift up the prayer that Jesus, your son, taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And um, just as the uh, praise team is coming up, we want to give a warm welcome back to Dale and Linda Cook. It's so good to see you. <clears throat> you were supposed to bring warm weather back from Arizona, you know. What, what is the deal here, you know? And also sneaking in, and, but sitting up front, you can tell she's not a true Methodist because she sat up front, um, our assistant district superintendent, Karen Cook. Let's welcome her too. <clears throat> Just before I read the scripture, um, <clears throat> I wanted to tell you that we had a, um, a request out from our bishop this week, and not this, not tomorrow, but the following Monday, April the 23rd, um, is the anniversary, the 50th anniversary, yes, the 50th anniversary of the forming of the United Methodist Church. You all know that there's not good feelings right now. Well, there's mixed feelings, but I'm here to tell you that we're worshiping Christ anyway. And so um, we're going to open up the church during the week. I mean, during the day when Erica's here, um, the church will be open. And I'm going to invite you to come into the sanctuary and to pray for our church and all who lead it, including the bishops, the council of bishops, and also the commission on the way forward. And then for an hour from six to seven, um, the sanctuary will be open in the evening and I will be here. I will pray with you. I will be here if nobody comes. I will be here praying for our church, and I invite you to come and pray with me. Um, it is not in the bulletin, so I'm telling you now, it, it will be in next week's bulletin. So why don't you come and pray for our church? If you're able, stand please as we read the scripture this morning. <clears throat> the scripture is from Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from far away. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This is the word of God from long ago for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. O oh Lord, as we have just heard your word and as we delve into it, Lord, open up our ears, our minds, our hearts, and our very souls so that we can truly hear you and feel your presence today to sustain us, to lift us up, and to give us strength for the coming week so we can go from here and proclaim your word to all we meet and greet. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, I asked this question last week, and I'm hoping to see more hands, but you shouldn't lie in church. Who read the chapter of Believe this week? Are there more hands? Yes, there are more hands coming up. Thank you very much. We're on chapter two, Personal God. How many of you, and again, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, how many of you have been worried about something this week? Or even this morning as we got here? Everything from getting somewhere on time. I do that way too much because I don't leave early enough. To what we will wear or what we will eat. To whether or not you can pay the bills or which bills do you pay? What will the test results be when I meet with the doctor? Or whether you will live long enough to experience a certain event? I wonder how much time this week, if we collectively could count how much time we spent on worrying, we would have spent. Did you know that worrying is the number one topic in the Bible? Every time the Bible tells us not to worry, or more commonly says, fear not, there are 365 references. Now, isn't that amazing? One for each day of the week. I think God has a message there. Don't worry. Walked in this morning and Lillian says, we may not have a computer. It's just doing an update. Now, I don't know why. You know, it's like worry when it really didn't make any difference. If we weren't saying the words, we didn't have the words. Can't we worship God anyway? Why do we spend so much time worrying when we know God says, do not fear, do not worry? Those were one of his final words to his disciples at the Last Supper. Don't worry, don't fear, it's going to be okay. And the disciples ran away in fear and they spent, we don't know how long, but many days just worrying. Do you know why we do that? 
because we take control of our own lives, everything in them. And then we aren't satisfied with that, so we start taking control of other people's lives as well and all their situations. We turn away from relying on God. So what would it look like this week if we took the time and the en energy we spend worrying and put it into believing in a personal God? Today we're moving from believing in God to believing in that God knows us, cares for us, never leaves us, and guides us if we are willing to trust and obey. Now, most of you have been in church-going people all your lives or a large part of your lives, and you say, yeah, well, I know that. Well, do you really know it deep down in your soul, not just in your mind, not even just in your heart, but in your very being? So today, and if you didn't do the reading, you better catch up. <laughs> Because sermons are based on our reading in the book. We're going to talk about six attributes of God that show us that God is a personal God. There is a handout, like I promised, so you can be following along in your handout. Make notes if you would like. And then at the bottom, there's a section that just says questions. I'd like to remind you or tell you if you weren't here last week. That I'm doing something very dangerous because God told me to. And I didn't write it down because I didn't want to share it. But God reminded me. If you have questions as we go along in this series, write them down. And there will be a basket. I forgot to get it. There will be a basket on the sound booth because we put everything on the sound booth. Put your questions in there. And at the end of this 10 weeks, I'm going to take one, two, three, four weeks, however long it takes to answer those questions. So the first characteristic of God is that God knows us. Psalm 139 that we heard this morning says that nothing we can say or do is anything that God doesn't already know. But he wants to hear from us. We cannot go anywhere and hide from God because he sees everything. When Hannah and Noel were little, Hannah was quiet. She could tear up a room in seconds, but she was quiet. And Noel was loud. So anytime there was a loud bang or a yell or anything, and I went running into the room, Noel would start running off at the mouth, and Hannah just stood there like a little angel. She was so pretty with her long hair, so innocent. It, and I would yell at Noel. It took a long time to realize that the writing on the wall was Hannah who wrote Noel's name, not Noel. It was Hannah who cut Noel's hair and hid the hair and the scissors way under the bed. Nothing we do is out of God's sight. God made us. He wove us together. He put purpose in our minds and our hearts and our souls. I'm going to continue to say heart, mind, soul, because thoughts start in the mind, but we have to let the love of God go to our hearts. And then we have to believe it in our souls. Psalm 139.6 says that God's knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above it that I can, above me that I cannot fathom it. We try to figure out God. We put God in a box. We think God is like a human because the Bible talks about God's hands and God's face and God's walking and human attributes, but God is not a human being. God is God. We're not supposed to understand or attain God's knowledge. Do you remember right after Noah and his family came off the ark, God told them what to do, to spread out and multiply over the whole earth. 
It's a shame that sin remained on the ark because people came out and they multiplied all right because that's what human beings do well. But they say it in one place. And they spoke one language, and they were similar of mind. And so, inevitably, when you get a bunch of humans together, you think you're more powerful than God. And they built a tower. And then God spread them out and changed their language. Why can't we just learn to trust and accept that we don't know everything? We never will. All we have to do is to accept the love that God is pouring on us every moment of every day. Have you ever finished a sentence for someone because you know exactly what they were thinking? Scary, isn't it? Or have you bought or received a gift, a perfect gift, because you knew someone or someone knew you that well? Or maybe you have read a biography of someone because you wanted to know more about them. Well, God does that for every single human being that has ever been born. Think about that. How can we say we understand? When God called Jeremiah to be his messenger, even though he knew that people wouldn't listen, he said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God says that to each and every one of us today too. So Jeremiah followed God and he spoke to the Israelites and he said, here's the message God wants you to know. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. If you will call on me, I will listen And you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now that to me doesn't sound like a God who's out there somewhere. God is a personal God. Do you realize today how deeply God knows you? And wants you to know him. Number two, God loves us. The Bible tells us over and over that God is love. When God created humans, he didn't just say it is good. He said it is very good. Do you know what that literally means? I love you. Isn't that awesome? John 3.16 says, For God, say it with me, so loved the world that he gave us his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is love. 1 John 4.10 tells us, It is not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to deal with our sin and to enable us to have that right relationship with God once again. It is impossible for God not to love us. I'm sure, like me, there's times that you've wanted to strangle your kids or grandkids. (laughs) That you haven't liked what they're doing, but deep down you still love them, don't you? God loves us 
no matter what we do, what we say. I know God loves me because, as the scripture says, I am not hungry. I have clothes to wear more than the lilies of the field. I have all my needs met and I have joy in my heart, which is the deepest kind of love anyone can ever receive. Do you know today how much God loves you? Number three, God cares about us. Psalm 8 says that humans were made a little lower than the angels. Wow! Did you hear that? We were made a little lower than the angels. God didn't say we were perfect, but he put us there because he loves us and he cares about us that much. And he crowned us with glory and honor. And he made us rulers over everything God created. He told us to take care of the earth and everything in it. Some days we do, and a lot of days we don't do that, do we? And then Psalm 23, one of my favorite psalms, tells us that we lack nothing that God even makes us lay down by green, in green pastures and by still waters to rest. That's my kind of rest. God refreshes us. He guides us. And he is always with us. God's goodness and love will follow us all the days of our life. And he gives us the promise of living in God's house with him forever and ever and ever. And I say, amen. Just in one psalm, that's what David tells us. Don't tell me God doesn't care about us. In the psalm, we're even told that when we walk through the darkest valleys, some versions say the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death. Think about a shadow. What's it caused by? Light. Even in that valley of the shadow of death in our journey in life, God is there. He's the light. And all we have to do is to follow it. After I knew that I needed to get out of my living situation, when I separated from my husband, I've told you about that, I had put it off and put it off and put it off. It took me a long time to realize why. Because I didn't know where I would, I would go. I had no place to stay. How was I going to look after my kids, even though one was in college and one was in uh, just finishing up high school? So I stayed put. And then one day, I cried out to God for help. I realized that I hadn't done that. My spiritual director told me, have you really cried out for God? Sure I have. No, you've been asking in prayer, but you haven't cried out in desperation for God to take over. So I took a day off and went away by myself and literally got on my knees, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried, because I didn't know what to do. Shortly after that, when I pieced everything together, God had the perfect timing for me. I was just about to be ordained. I had been given a new church. People suddenly moved out of the parsonage, because they were renting it, and we weren't going to move people out. And all of that happened in a row. I had a church and my own salary. And I moved out. Do you know how much God cares for you? 
And number four is God sees us. In the time the New Testament was written, I've already, we talked a lot about how the Israelites were under pressure from all those who lived in the culture, very like today. They worshipped pagan gods. We have pagan gods in the form of technology, social media. Do I have to go on? The reason they worshipped these pagan gods is just in case they missed something and they didn't want the gods to be angry with them. But the one true God does not dwell on high in the heavens on a lofty throne. I know we say God sits on his throne, but he doesn't dwell there. He isn't protected by minor gods and warriors. No, God came down here to earth to be with us, to dwell with us. And just like the father walked with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, his son, walked here on earth, taught and performed miracles to show us how to live. And then God sent the gift of the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and to be with us until Jesus comes again. God sees us. He sees our pain and our sorrow our grief, our loss, and our hurts. But he also sees our joys and our happiness. Story of Abraham and Sarah, Sarai, when, she, when they decided to take God's plan into their own hands and here, take my maidservant, get her pregnant, and then she'll have a baby for me because that must be what God wants. Oops, forgot to contact God and say, is this your plan? Even then, when Hagar had Ishmael and Mer Sarah and Hagar could not get along, and Hagar was sent out into the desert, not once but twice, God said, I'm with you. And you know, Hagar gets a, we don't talk about her too much because Abraham and Sarah are the mother and the father of the Israelite nation. But Hagar is the one who says, you are the God who sees me. And God blessed her and her son and developed a great nation. We forget that. It's the Muslims today. Why can't we learn to get along? Because God loves all of us. Just saying. Aren't you glad that God can come down here and mop up our messes and even turn them into something good. Thank God. God came and mopped up my mess, the mess that I had made, and put his love in my heart and brought me here to Marion. Who would have thought, huh? Oh. I'm glad I'm here. When my parents died, and I wasn't ready for it, when my sister-in-law committed suicide very drastically, it's not something I wanted, but God saw our family's pain. And because of that, I am more aware I have a lot more awareness for those who are caring for eldering parents because I didn't get to do that. And families who have lost loved ones, especially to suicide. Do you realize that God sees all of who you are all the time? Number five, God listens to us. Have you ever thought, well, I've prayed about that for years. Obviously, God's not listening to me. <laughs> Come on, I know you have. I'm going to admit, I've said that once or twice, or maybe a few more than twice. The story of Hezekiah that's in our chapter this week is wonderful. Hezekiah falls ill, and he prays to God, Lord, I'm not ready to die yet. I have so much more work to do. 
Why don't you let me live so I can continue your plan? God listened to him and gave him 15 more years, even told him, I'm going to give you 15 years. If you knew how long you had left to live, what would you do with that time? Hezekiah did many great things. Abraham pleads with God because his nephew Lot is living close to Sodom, well, in Sodom and Gomorrah, and says, if I, well, you only find 40 good people, will you save the town, towns? And God says, okay. Well, what if it's 30? What if it's 10? God agrees with him and he listens. And he enables Abraham to take his nephew and his family out of there before he destroys the town because they were the only good people in it. David in the Psalms talks to God in song because he knows that God listens. There's three ways God answers our prayers. Yes, those are the best kind, aren't they? No, that hurts. And wait. We witnessed that on the screen this morning. That was amazing. Please wait. We're not very good at waiting, are we? Patience is not a word that's in my characteristic, unfortunately. I'm trying. But we cannot see the whole picture of what's going on right now, let alone what's going to happen in the next hour, the next week, the next few years, even the next century. And when we trust God, God knows. He knows everything that's going to happen, and he puts our lives together like a jigsaw puzzle because his timing is perfect. When I was going to move out, and I knew I was going to, the first thing I wanted to do was to buy furniture because I didn't have anything. I wanted to make sure the kids had beds, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And I knew I had a tight budget. I wanted to go out right then. And I felt God saying, no, wait. God, you don't understand. The sale's going on right now. Now is the time to go. Well, then God made me so busy that I didn't even have time to go grocery shopping, let alone furniture shopping. And it came close to the time for me to move. And a very amazing thing happened. One of the parishioners in that church that I was serving had decided that they had storage units with furniture in it that had been their parents and all their kids were married and had their own furniture. And it was stupid to pay this bill for storage when they didn't need it. So they had this huge sale and they told me about it before it happened. I was still so busy so I got a trailer and gave my car and trailer to my daughter and said, go see what they have. And she came back not only with furniture for me, but for her apartment also. And get this, we paid for it all less than half of what I budgeted. God says, trust me. Wait, I am listening and I know what's going to happen. When is the last time you really talked to and then stopped and listened to God? Because God will talk to you. And the last one for today is that God is for us. Romans says that God works for the good of those who love him. God did not even spare his own son, but he gave him up for us because he is for us, not against us. Nothing in earth or in the heavens can separate us from the love of God unless we deliberately put that barrier there. We'd be pretty stupid to do that, wouldn't we? When God wants a personal relationship with us. James, Jesus' brother, wrote this. We must believe 
and not doubt. God never wants bad things to happen to us. So why do bad things happen? An age-old question, so don't bother writing that down because I'm answering that one already. So you can rip your papers up now, right? I don't have the full answer to that. I don't think anybody does. But what I, this is what I believe. That since the beginning of humankind, through all the centuries of our ancestors, human sin has mounted and mounted and mounted. And that has produced more sin and the evil and the bad things that happen to us in the world today. God did not cause any of it. And God won't stop it. Because how would we learn our lessons? We are to trust God and God alone because he is the one who cares for us and knows what is best for us. Even when, like Abraham and Sarah, we step in and say, oh, this must be what I've got to do. God shows us the way if we listen and obey. Hey, I'm a poet. <laughs> So that when bad things happen, God will provide a way out for us. The desperation, the guilt, the pain, the suffering I felt after I fil filed for divorce was something I never dreamed I would ever have to go through. And yet today, my heart is full of joy and happiness and forgiveness. And it's okay. Matthew's gospel gives us the answer for how God is for us. When it says, we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, we've got to become more like Jesus. That's what this series is all about. And then everything else that we need will be given to us. That's a promise that God keeps. Do you know that God is for you, not against you? The one true God is a personal God who loves, who knows, loves, cares, sees, listens, and is for us. Let's say our key idea together. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Let's say it again like you really do. And if you don't, say it again anyway, because you'll learn to believe it. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. And now let's say our key verse together. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, you made us, you care for us, you love us. You listen to us, you see us, and you are for us. Help us live into that. Help us to believe more deeply, to become more like Christ in all we do, and to give up our unbelief. In your name we pray, amen. Let us stand and sing our final song together.
Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, Lord, we do lift your name on high today because you lift us up there too. You love us. You care for us. Help us to let go of the control we think we have on our own lives and to trust you more. You are our personal God who cares for every one of us. So as we leave this place, go before us, behind us, beside us. Surround us with your love and give us the courage and the strength to share this news with other people. In your name we pray and all God's children say, amen. amen.